Well, uh, thank you very much, Sheila, and, and congratulations uh, being the president and Paul, who was the past president. I just wanted to do a shout out for Paul Edison Lam because I'm on the State Board of Geology Examiners and Paul is one of our newest members and he is the outside non-geologist, but he is quite a geologist to have in the non-geology and doing a wonderful job for the state of Oregon. Um, and so I'm excited tonight to talk about the geology of Iceland, one of the most exciting geological places on the face of the earth. Uh, and so for the last four years, I've been leading trips there uh, for the Smithsonian Institute out of uh, Portland. And even GSOC members have been on this trip. And I will show you pictures of two G GSOC members who were on it just two years ago. Uh, and um, Iceland Air um, flies directly from here to Iceland. So it's a place that you can go visit. I'm also half Scandinavian. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Sc some of the, the ultimate uh, Viking territory and some of the historical things uh, tonight too. So, uh, so that's the background I just want uh, to this. And so what we're going to do is do a little uh, share screen and we are going to go up and load my little old PowerPoint. Let's see if we can get it. There we go. There we and go. Good. Uh, can everybody see that? Yes, I can. All right. And I'm, I'm hoping everybody else can too. And so we're going to zip through this. And uh, I call it uh, Iceland, the land of fire and ice. And uh, also, uh, uh, at one time we thought it was the site of the world's biggest freshwater flood. Now we've recalculated that. And it's now number three. And the Missoula floods are the biggest ones. And so we'll come back to that coming up. So. Um, let's see if I can get in here. There we go. Oops. Um, so what am I going to be talking about? Um, that you know, uh, first of all, uh, Iceland is on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And so I'm going to talk about plate tectonics. It's moving 1.8 centimeters a year and it's a hot spot. And because of that being a hot spot, there are lots of volcanoes there. I'm going to talk about the bedrock geology. I'm going to talk about earthquakes. I'm going to talk about geothermal energy the fumaroles, the hot springs, the geysers. There are glaciers there. The biggest glacial field in Europe is there. Waterfalls and rivers are everywhere. And then the eruption of Eyjafjallajökull in 2010 was incredible. And then at the end, I just have, because I also have a background in biology, uh, talk a little bit about the few plants, the few animals that are there, and a little bit about the history there. So that's, that is the plan of attack for tonight. And then if you have questions at the end, probably the easiest thing to do is just type them into the chat box. And then when we get to the end, Sheila will just read those out, okay? Um, let's see. Uh, here we go. Okay, so here is a map of Iceland, and I've got my little pointer here. Uh, when you fly into it, you uh, land in the very southwestern part of the uh, country, at Keflavik. That's where the Americans had the Air Force Base for many, many years. And then you travel into Reykjavik, which is the capital. You note that there is a big ring road that goes all the way around the country, and a lot of people who have time uh, uh, travel on the ring road. I'm going to be showing you a couple of very special places out down in the southeast, Vatniokel. That is the largest ice field in Europe uh, with all of the, many of the glaciers coming down uh, uh, very close to the sea. Down at the south end, the Westman Islands, uh, that is where Heime is. I'm going to be talking about, and Surtsey. Those are two islands that are very, very important. I'll show you some pictures there. Keflavik, which is out here, is uh, southeast. Very important because just two months ago, we had a lot of magma coming up to the surface, and it looks like that will be the site of the next volcanic eruption. And that's right where the airport is, so it could be a problem for people getting in and out of the, the country there. Um, I, it's, uh, the big peninsula to the western side, the Snifley's Nest, Peninsula. I will show you some pictures out in that area. And then we'll go up to the north and Mivatan, the north center place just south of Husafik. That is a major valley right on the Mid Atlantic Ridge. I'll show you lots and lots of volcanic eruption type of materials that are down in, the, in that area there. So that's kind of uh, the background to this beautiful island. Um, 
many of you have seen the pictures of breakup of Pangaea breaking into Gondwana land in Laurasia. Um, basically, Iceland is only 20 million years old. And so it did not move around like plates, but the hotspot did. And then in between Greenland and Europe is the hotspot uh, down in the lower left-hand side where we are today. And so here's a great map here, uh, Iceland, which is just southeast of Greenland. Um, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is moving 1.8 centimeters a year uh, from one side to the other. So if we take away all the water in the, in the Atlantic, you have got the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and this little hotspot is sitting on that Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Basic physiography of the country. Uh, it is about the size of Ohio, and that's the main island. There are a couple little smaller islands around it. And uh, the uh, highest peak that you get there is only just about 7,000 feet high. Uh, so not huge, huge mountains, but remember we are 180 miles south of the Arctic Circle, so most of the vegetation up there is going to be uh, primarily uh, Arctic uh, uh, vegetation. Population, whole country, 325,000 people and about half of them live in Reykjavik. And about 80% of the country is just not populated. It's interesting, it has a very mild climate for being so far north um, because of the uh, North Atlantic current uh, uh, that comes up just south of there. It comes up along the east coast of the United States from the Caribbean uh, and then comes over. Average temperature in Reykjavik in the wintertime is 31 degrees Fahrenheit and in the summertime, 52. Annual precipitation is more than Portland. Uh, it's 40 to 60 inches a year. As you travel through the country, it's amazing the names that you have got there. I'm not gonna try and pronounce the name of this little creek that is here, but there are huge ones. Now, the first word that we always teach everybody when they come into the country is this word. Schnurting. Schnurting is the restroom. So you don't ask for the, uh, the, uh, the toilet or everything. Well, of course, most everybody speaks English, but the, you ask for the schnurting. So how about the tectonics? Uh, and so I showed you the map earlier, and the mid-Atlantic ridge comes right down through Mivat and then splits in the middle part of the country, half of it going down through Keflavik and Reykjavik, the other part just south uh, through Vik. Uh, that you have got. And so uh, it, it's fun to be out there in one of these areas and one side of the valley is going towards Europe and the other towards North America. And I always take uh, the, my group when we go there and you get a chance to sit on one of these cracks and one crack is going towards Europe and the other crack is going towards North America. The most famous place where you have the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is just outside of Reykjavik. Uh, and this is Thingvellir. This valley here, the, the mountains you see on the other side are going towards Europe, and then the, in back of us, where I took this picture, is going towards North America. And, and, and so this is the site of the very first parliament, um, and, uh, and it's called Thingvellir, uh, and it's right down, halfway down this slope here is where all of the Viking warriors, the head of each one of the clans, would meet every year, uh, and it's one of the world's oldest democracies around. And here's just an artist drawing of what it would be like for all of those people in those days. Uh, they had no written language, and so one guy had to memorize all the rules and regulations, and he stood on a rock right down kind of in the center part of the, um, the, the slide here, and he recited nonstop for three days all of those rules and regulations. So how about the volcanoes in Iceland? There are about 100 volcanoes that are there, 35 are active, and that means that they have erupted in the last 10,000 years. And they, because this is on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and it's a hotspot, they average uh, eruption about once every five years. Most of them are tourist eruptions. Why? It's a hotspot. And so the magma is coming from deep down in the, the mantle of the earth. It is mafic uh, magma is coming up to the surface and it oozes out. It's just like Hawaii, there are oozers that are there. And so the, the oldest rocks that are found here are either in the east or the western half of the, the country, and those uh, are about 20 million years old. So about a quarter of the country is actually on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and we define it as being uh, 25 miles wide in the north and 40 miles wide in the south that you've got. 
And so you, you get a lot of fissures where all of the eruptions come out. And so little volcanoes along these faults, basically, where the magma is coming up. Here is a small little volcano out on the Snifley's Nest uh, Peninsula where I take people. You can see uh, it's not a huge structure at all, but you can see the lava field around it. Uh, it has different vegetation than the older uh, rock in, in front of you that is there. Uh, the most famous volcano in the, in the country is the Hecla volcano. Uh, and it, uh, uh, it is supposed to be the openings, the mouth to hell. And, and it last erupted about the year 2000. Uh, and one of the local guides that I worked with actually owns a farm right on the footstep, the foot slopes of Hecla. Now going back up to the north, Mivatan. Um, and uh, two uh, major eruptions occurred up in that area. Um, and and the, the, first of all, 1724 to 1729, we had the Mibatan fires. Uh, and the, this is a series of eruptions that were, was there, but one, and, and, and this was primarily not underwater, not under glaciers, so just oozers. And there was a hill in back of Mivatan, and the, the volcano was erupting, and the, the lava flow was coming right down to three farms. Everybody got together. They prayed and prayed and prayed in the church, and the lava flow came down and split around the church, saved the church. And I'll show you pictures of that in a second. And it's very famous in Iceland history. Also, an infamous one occurred in the mid-1970s. They were just uh, drilling a geothermal well. Uh, and they, what they did is they got down into a magma chamber and you had a Mount Kefla erupted as a result of that. So humans can, if they drill in the wrong place, cause a volcanic eruption. But these are all uh, some of the volcanoes found up in the Mivatan area. Uh, this one is only about 3,000 years old. There's a large lake there. Uh, and in the lake, there are a whole bunch of little craters that are there. Here is Greybrock and Graberbacher Fell uh, are just a couple of the many volcanoes that are up there. Here is a picture I took in the church um, of the erupting volcano in, on the, on the uh, podium uh, in front of the church. And somebody carved this into the wood and the erupting volcano is in the background. Here comes the um, lava flow down and it splits and goes to the right and to the left and saves the church. And so I always take my, uh, the people on my trips, you can see the lava flow flowed right down here and then saved the area here and now it's the graveyard. Uh, and then also in the Mivatan area, they have a whole bunch of these cones. Look out in this lake here. They're called pseudo-volcanoes. What is a pseudo-volcano? Because they look just exactly like cinder cones, but these are areas where lava flows flowed across a swampy area. And the hot lava, uh, the water that was below it boiled it and the boiling uh, gases forming fumaroles would come up through the lava flow and create a pseudo crater. And so just if it, because it looks like it is a real um, crater or a cinder cone, it, it could be a pseudo crater if it was formed in the right way. Also in the Mibotan area is one of my favorite places there. And, and fumaroles everywhere. Look at all the fumaroles that are here. And they, they, uh, all of these areas underneath these metal uh, uh, planks that you see there, uh, are, they're baking bread. Uh, and, they, and the Scandinavians love that very, very dark rye bread. And so we always stop and we get a chance to, at the, there's a little restaurant there, and have Icelandic char on the uh, uh, rye bread that is cooked in these fumaroles there. And, and absolutely wonderful. I, uh, my wife waters for two days in uh, anticipation of going to that stop. Now on all my trips, I always make sure that everybody climbs a volcano. Now we climb a cinder cone and here, here is one uh, that you, you'll see as we're climbing all the way up to the top. Uh, now, most of the way it is on a staircase. Um, but two years ago, from uh, two G soccer's, two of my favorite G soccer's, Dave and Linda Tozer from uh, Tiger Twalin area, were on the trip, and Dave tripped on one of the steps and crashed down and hit his nose. Had to be rushed to the hospital. I'll show you a picture at the end of what he looked like uh, a couple days later. But he survived, and we had a great time there. Uh, but at the top, you see a whole series of of 
small cinder cones all lined up in a row, all, all on an old fault system that you've got there. We go back to the Lockheed eruptions uh, that, uh, that occurred. Um, uh, oh, the, this is down in the central part of the country. Uh, and one of the most famous volcanic eruptions in the world, the largest volca vol uh, volcanic eruption in modern history, three cubic miles of, of lava came out of the volcano. 130 craters were created. But there were also a lot of noxious gases that came out of this, this volcano. And mainly it was sulfuric acid, huge amounts of sulfuric acid. It killed 20% of the population in the country and 50% of the livestock in the country. And then for the next five to 10 years, it was a famine. Uh, and uh, so in, in, in volcanic history in the world, one of the most famous eruptions and very, very awful. Here is Lake Lockheed. This is the major uh, crater of the 130 that you, you get a chance to see there. And then I just wanted to mention a couple other volcanic eruptions. Um, when I was getting into geology in the mid 1960s, a new volcano had erupted just south of Heimei uh, Island in the Westerman Islands called Surtsey. And all of a sudden a volcano erupted and an island came out of the Atlantic Ocean. And they made movies of this. And I still remember the movie and that got me interested in geology. Uh, and here is a picture in 1964 of the eruption. Look at the size of that eruption. And, and then biologists have now followed this, uh, this eruption in this island. And do you know what the very first plant was? They were interested. What, what, what will be the plants that will come? The very first plant that uh, grew on this island was a tomato plant. Uh, a geologist on the island in the early days didn't quite finish his or her uh, tomato sandwich, threw it down into the rocks, and one of the seeds vegetated and formed a tomato plant. But uh, also in the Westman Islands is uh, Heime. And this is my favorite place in the country. And it's, it's a huge harbor uh, uh, created by the different uh, lava flows that are coming down here. And so a majority of the fishing fleet for the country is in this uh, place here. And so if we go into the center of the harbor and then look up to the uh, northeast, uh, back in 1973, uh, a big cinder cone just erupted right in the back of the town. And they had to evacuate the whole town overnight. The good news is um, the whole fleet was in town uh, at that time, and so they could put everybody onto boats except the fire department. They kept the fire department. I'll talk about that in a second. And so here is a picture of the volcano erupting and the flows going down to the right-hand side there. In the town, you look back up and you can see the volcano erupting just in the background and look at the tops of all the houses. They have all this uh, cinder that was on the top of them. Um, so it erupted in 1973, it buried, the lava flows buried a third of the town, and that was about 400 houses and buildings. They kept the fire department on the, the, the town because as the lava flows were coming down, the fire department would squirt the lava and cool it down and therefore creating a barricade, forcing the lava to go in another direction, uh, and then it flowed out and it actually increased the size of the harbor that was there. Uh, and then they, they got a lot of the pumps that moved out there from the Air Force Base, and I'll show you one of those. Uh, all these islands down there are less than 10,000 years old. And so here is one of the major flows that was, here's the edge of the town on the right-hand side, and you can see they got the flow to go to out and increase the size of the harbor. So here we are down in the town looking up, and you'll see the large cinder cone to the left. That is the one that erupted in 73. So I'm going to take you on a little hike. We got off of the boat. We're walking up through the field of lupins. I'll come back to those plants in a second. And we're onto the old lava flow. And then as you go up the lava flow, every place that there is a, was a house beneath there, uh, you will see that nobody died in the eruption, by the way. They got everybody out. And then you go walking right up through the heart of this 1973 lava flow heading up to that uh, cinder cone on the left-hand side. Here you go by one of the old uh, uh, pumps uh, that happens to be there on your way up. Then you get into the crater up there, and then you say, well, let's go up to the top. Well, you go up on the right-hand side, then come across 
on the ridge. So when you're on the top, looking back, you can see uh, the, the past eruption, which was about 500 years earlier uh, there. And then you look onto the mainland and there's, see that big white volcano, snow covered, that's Hecla, that's the awful guy, the, uh, the entrance to the underworld that is there. You get to the top and everything is highly oxidized that is there. Look on the back side, this is the northeast side, you can see a lava flow that flowed down in that direction there. And then you get up there and you do your hero shot. And that's my wife, Glenda, up there. Just, hey, we made it to the top. And there's Hecla off in the distance and then some of the other uh, Westerman Islands that are there. Now we're looking back at the village, uh, uh, the town that is still there. And then you can see the edge of the lava flow on the right-hand side uh, that came down in 73. And then you, you reach down in between all the rocks and you can feel, uh, feel steam vents, hot steam still coming up uh, because those rocks are still hot. And then you look down uh, and you can see that this is where the town used to be. The third of the town used to be over here. That's all covered by a lava flow. Keep an eye on this area right here the, uh, on the little island. There, this is, there's that big, huge scar there. This is the whole town, part of the town was covered by the, um, the lava flow that came down in 73. And so you just go back, see there's the lava flow, and that, that's what it used to look like before 1973. Uh, and then uh, as you're walking down the edge of the lava flow, you can see buildings that are crushed and filled up. One of those houses was excavated and there's a museum that you can go in today. And this is underground uh, and, and they excavate it. And you can look on the table and this one here, you can still see the dishes from the dinner that there, was there. And then in the bathroom, the toothpaste is still left on the counter there. So what type of bedrock would you expect here? Well, I expected it to be 100% basalt because it's a hot spot. Well, it's only about 80%. And there are others because the crust is so thick here, when that magma is coming up through that hot spot, there's a distillation of, of some of the magma and you end up with a more silica rich magma at the top. And there are rhyolite cones and there are other ones that are dacite that are there. So a third of all the lava on the land and the Earth's surface, this has been calculated by the Icelanders, and modern history is found on Iceland. Now the majority of the rock that you have here is a, -A basalt, little pohoihoi, and some scoria that you have got. And so it just reminds you of the three major types of uh, volcanic rocks. You have rhyolite, andesite, which is intermediate, and then mafic is your basalt. Uh, and so most of the rock is over here on the mafic end, but then we do find a little bit on the other side. So most of the eruptions that you've got are fissure eruptions uh, that are going up to the top and just, uh, uh, you'll get a, a lava, maybe some pohoihoi lava. This is a picture from, not from Iceland, but it's from Hawaii that I use in my uh, 201 classes. And so you do sometimes get pohoihoi lava. The first day when I'm out in the field with people on my trips, what do I do? I take them across a bridge and there is pohoihoi lava. Look at that old weathered pohoihoi, the top of one of those flows that you can see here. But as you go across the country, you just see layer upon layer upon layer, just like you would in Hawaii, of flow upon flow upon flow. You also get some beautiful columnar jointing. And this is underneath the Svartifoss, uh, um, uh, Waterfall, Foss means waterfall. Uh, and, and so there's some beautiful columnar jointing that you see. Also, as you get down towards the, the ocean, there are places you can see here where you have got uh, highly oxidized flows uh, as the flows flowed into the ocean down in those particular areas. This rock outcrop, I'll point out a little bit later on because we see some, um, some xenoliths coming up from below. Now, one of the most amazing deposits I have ever seen in my life was basaltic tuff here. And so here is, uh, this is out in the Snifley's Nest Peninsula. And if you remember, volcanic tuff is, uh, is going to be, when you have an active eruption, a violent volcano of ash, cinder, and lapilli that is there, and then it gets fused together, um, you will have, uh, a volcanic tuff. 
Most of it is rhyolitic or dacitic, more violent eruptions. But this is basalt. You don't get violent eruptions unless the eruption occurs underneath a volcano, uh, underneath a glacier. Uh, and then here it is up close. There's my finger for uh, pointing to a piece. Uh, and, and so you have scoria that is basaltic, but then in between you have all of the ash and cinder and lapilli that is fusing it together and then it is uh, then melted together, uh, forming basaltic tuff. And the only place in the world you get basaltic tuff is when the eruption occurs underneath a, a glacier. And, and, and so it, be it becomes violent, but there's no place for anything to go, and so it stays underneath there. Here is a diorite zeal, xenolith in the basalt, and that's brought up uh, as lava flow is coming up to the surface. Uh, and then as it comes up to the surface, it breaks off some of the wall rock and it's diorite. And, it's brought, and then it becomes a class and then solidified out there. Now this is also on the Snifley's uh, Nest Peninsula. And look at, the, look at the rock, it's very, very light in color. And you say, whoa, that's not basalt. No, it's rhyolite. This is a rhyolite, three rhyolite domes all in a row out here. Um, and this is from the past. And this is magma's coming from deeper down in and a lot more um, uh, uh, of it is actually being um, distilled off and then increasing the amount of uh, silica in the there. Along the coastlines, you get some incredible incredible uh, stacks and arches that are there, great places for nesting birds, uh, and just millions and millions of birds everywhere. So if you've got a place on the mid-Atlantic Ridge, you're going to have earthquakes, and they do. They, about every hundred years, you have a very, very large one. 1784, it was a, a 7.5 magnitude uh, eruption. Many houses, farms, and churches destroyed. 1912, an, another 7.0. And then in the year 2000, they had three days of a 6.5, 5.5, 6.6, the highest on each day. But we're still waiting, they are waiting uh, for the 7.0 plus. Uh, 2008, they had a 6.3. So the big one is yet to come, but this is tectonically active where two plates are uh, separating from one another. Geothermal energy is huge here in this country. 85% of the heating of the houses is by geothermal energy. Uh, and then hot water, I'll show you coming out of the hot springs, is used to, uh, for your showers. Uh, and, uh, and, and so every time you take a shower in, in the country, it smells like sulfur. Why? Because it's coming out of a hot spring and it's free. Uh, and so it is wonderful. And so this is a country that specializes in clean energy, as we will see. Almost every community in the country has an open air geothermally heated swimming pool. This was passed maybe 50, 60 years ago by the legislature. We want everybody to learn how to swim and we will put in free swimming pools that we've got. Reykjavik, the name of the capital is, is short for Smoky Bay. The first settlers, the first Vikings to come in here, there were fumaroles everywhere. And they said, whoa, we'll call it Reykjavik. Uh, and then in 1930, they started piping the hot water into the towns from 30 miles away into Reykjavik. Now it's common all over the country. And the world's largest geothermal station is actually located in uh, Iceland. So as you're driving throughout the country, fumaroles just out in the middle of the countryside are common everywhere. You'll see, see steam coming up everywhere you go. Uh, this is actually up in the Bivatan area. All the guides always bring a, a one or two uh, eggs with them. You put them in the rocks uh, at this fumarole here, and five minutes later, you have a hard boiled egg to take away and show to everybody in the, the group. Uh, so this is in the Mibotan area. That's the area around where I just showed you. It's called the Solfatara. Uh, and in that same area, lots of bubbling uh, mud pit, pat, uh, pits and fumaroles everywhere. Here is also a big mud pit that is found in that area there. This is out uh, just in north central uh, part of the country. Uh, hot spring coming out. Very, very hot water that was there. And they captured it. And that is taken into the surrounding five or six towns. That will become heating uh, for the buildings and then uh, through radiators in the houses. And then secondly, hot water for the showers that you've got there. 
Uh, and then also next to all these hot springs, you will find huge numbers of greenhouses. And so they are producing a huge amount of vegetables uh, nonstop all year round. And when I was there that day, uh, uh, you could buy tomatoes that were produced in those hot houses. Many of these steam vents uh, are where faults intersect one another or where there is a fault. And you can just map out the steam vents and you say, oh, there's a fault that is in that area here. And so geothermal par uh, plants are all over the country. Uh, sometimes you have roads that go right underneath the piping of the water. This is a major pipeline uh, up in the Mivatan area. And then this is the major pipeline going into Reykjavik and, and supplying people with the hot uh, water. It's interesting, they pump a lot of that hot water into three big tanks overlooking the city. And then it, it, it flows by gravity down into the houses from there. And around those tanks, they've turned it into a tourist attraction with a great uh, restaurant that is overlooking the city. Uh, and then they also have a museum of different things related to Iceland. One place is like they take you inside a glacier. So where, when you travel throughout the country, uh, there are hot springs everywhere. I love them because I love going into hot tubs. Every night at the hotel that we would be, or lodge that we were staying at, we would always have a hot tub to kind of relax with at the end of the day. But the world's uh, most famous tourist attraction in Iceland is called the Blue Lagoon. And it is a huge um, uh, hot spring and a big pool. And they take busloads and busloads of people out there. I love going to it. It's wonderful. It is a murky, bl light blue color. Uh, but it's not natural. It is the uh, excess water from a geothermal power plant that was there. And maybe uh, 20, 30 years ago, uh, something like that, um, guys would get off work and instead of going home, they would go into just the, the dump pond next to the power plant there and they would sit there for half hour or something like that, then go home. And then the people, owners of the uh, power plant said, whoa, why don't we turn this into a tourist attraction? Because a lot, uh, the, there were so many minerals in the hot water that it plugged up all the holes in the basalt flow. Uh, and so it, it created a nice big pool. And then they had to add some cold water to it to, uh, for, the, for the amount that they had there. Uh, the water comes out 240 degrees Fahrenheit from two kilometers uh, deep down. Uh, and, and so this is what it looks like today. And, and many, many people will go and visit there and, and they have it well organized where you go and stuff like that. But if you look at the background, there's the power plant. Now that's, that power plant is now behind big, huge fences and stuff like that. And you don't get the idea that it is the excess water from the power plant that is there. This is an early picture there when they had the power plant there, but that's what the water looks like and it's really fun. And throughout the country, then there are just natural hot springs that are there, which is uh, kind of fun to, to use. Also, this is the land of geyser, and that's where we got the word geyser. Uh, uh, the great geyser um, uh, used to erupt up to 196 feet high. It's now dormant. It came back to life in the year 2000. Everybody was very excited, and then it fizzled out the next year. Uh, but there is one right next to it called the Stoker geyser, which means churning geyser. Every five minutes, it erupts 100 feet. And so it never, uh, um, uh, the tourists really, really love it uh, as you're going by there. And this is what the Stoker uh, geyser looks like. You can get very, very close to it. Uh, and I, I probably have 100 pictures of it because it's so much fun to, uh, to see every time you go out. There is the site of the old geyser. Uh, and it still has hot water coming out of it, but the whole chamber system inside uh, was broken uh, apart by some uh, fault uh, earthquake sometime in the past. Glaciers dominate a good portion of the uh, central uh, eastern part, uh, western part of the country here. It, it, the land is born of fire, born of fire, but shaped by ice. The name Iceland is interesting. Ingolfur Arneson. He's an early Viking, came through in the 1800s, and he landed on the southeastern coast. What did he see? Glaciers, glaciers, glaciers at that time. So what did he call it? He named it Iceland. And then it's interesting, the first uh, Viking people going to uh, Greenland, 
They landed in the southeastern part too, and it was the only part of the country really vegetated. They called it Greenland. It really, Greenland should be Iceland and Iceland should be Greenland because Iceland is only 11% of the country is covered by ice. During the Little Ice Age, uh, which was 1580, 1580 1850, uh, all the glaciers re-advanced. Now everything is in retreat now and going way, way back. Many of them are on volcanoes, uh, and this is dangerous when a, uh, a, a volcano erupts underneath a glacier. The world's large, uh, sorry, Europe's largest ice cap or ice field uh, is Vatniokel that I pointed out before. And here is a map of the country. There is Vatniokel. Now I'm gonna, I wanna show you the area up to the north. The biggest waterfall in the country is Detifoss. I'm gonna show you that one coming up there. But this is also the site of the world's, at one time, a few years ago, we thought it was the world's largest flood, like the Missoula floods. Uh, ice dam uh, lake built up in here, it came out in through here. Uh, and so I just wanted to point that out to you. And there's the Mivatan area that is over here. Uh, so a lot of the people who go to Mivatan go to the, um, the, the, the Deddy Floss area over here. So the, let's, let's go back. I'm gonna show you mostly pictures from the Vatney Ocal and then many of the uh, glaciers that are breaking off and going, the valley glaciers coming off of the ice field in the, in the center there. Also back down here, right in the southwestern uh, part of the country is Eyjafjallajökull, a very small glacier down there, but that is under which in the year 2010, the uh, volcano erupted. So as you fly across these uh, glaciers, huge amounts of ice that are found up there. Uh, the tourism is just burgeoning uh, in Iceland and you could take a horse trail, uh, horse trips on Icelandic horses up into those areas. Here is one of the uh, valley glaciers coming off of Vatna Yokel, and many of them uh, going down those valleys. This one is just to the south of Vatna Yokel, uh, actually has a big lake there and you can ride around it on a lake in and out of the icebergs. And uh, here we are, the Vatna Yokel is off in the distance and, and back there's one and two major uh, valley glaciers coming off of that ice field in the past. If you have a friend you don't like, take them on a, a trip up on the glacier and take them next to a crevasse and toss them in the crevasse, as they are uh, joking about doing on this trip there. And here we are looking into the center part of Vatniokel, one of these valley glaciers coming off there. Now further on down below the glaciers, you could, all, you could always tell if a river has a glacier at the end uh, because they're braided streams. Braided streams, they, they just don't have enough uh, water in them to carry all of the load that is there. Uh, and so, uh, the, especially the southeastern part of the country, this is what all of the, uh, the glacial stream areas look like. Why aren't there anybody living there? Because they get yokel outs. These um, glacial outburst, da outburst dams, and I'll talk about those coming up in a second. Also, huge fjords here, especially in the west and in the eastern part of the island. And they were carved primarily during the last 2.8 million years when the country had many different glaciers on top of them. This is out in the west fjords. Those are the most beautiful ones uh, that are found out on that side. Uh, here is a little peninsula going out into one of the fjords there. Look at how steep they are. Big, beautiful U-shaped valleys filled with salt water. And this is in the east fjords. You can see, look at all of the geese uh, that are here in the water in front. Uh, as I mentioned before, the word foss means waterfall. Uh, and here is the first waterfall that I always take my people to on. And instead of going over the top of a cliff, it comes out of the center part of a cliff. The water goes down to a very, very dense layer of lava and flows laterally until it comes out. Uh, and it's absolutely fun to go visit. Here is Deddy Foss. This is the world's largest one. I told you north of that Neokal. It's so big you can't get it into your photo. Uh, you just have to take you know, a picture like this of, of just maybe one eighth of it. It is just mind boggling the size of that. This is my favorite picture that I ever took in Iceland. This is Gullfoss. This is just outside of Reykjavik. Uh, and this is the Golden Waterfall. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of people stop in Iceland and just for one day or two days and they do the golden circle. And they go to Thingvellir, uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge where I showed you uh, uh, the modern uh, parliament was started. Then they go to Gullfoss, which is this beautiful 
waterfall that you hike all the way down onto the pedestal. Uh, it, it's actually an interflow area in between a couple lava flows. Uh, and then you go to uh, uh, also a couple other waterfalls, but then you also go to uh, uh, the geyser. And, and, and then maybe at the end of the day, you go to uh, the Blue Lagoon and you do it all in one day. Uh, in the wintertime, that's not my picture. I haven't been there in the wintertime. Uh, everything gets frozen up at Gulf Oss. But waterfalls are everywhere in the country. And we, we only stop at just, you know, maybe eight to uh, 15 waterfalls during the uh, 10 days that I'm there. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you pass by hundreds and hundred ones. Here, here's Goa Foss, just uh, mind boggling. Here's Goa Foss. This is all of the gods uh, that you have coming down. It's just powerful. With all that water there, you probably have hydroelectricity, and they do. 70% of the power that is uh, used in the country comes from this. Now, hydro, uh, geothermal forms a good portion of the rest of it. First hydroelectric plant was built in 1904. So this is a clean uh, energy type of country that you've got. Now I mentioned these Yokalops. Yokalops are glacial outburst floods. What happens is uh, uh, a, a lake will develop underneath the glacier and then uh, in, the, in the plumbing system of the glacier and then all of a sudden all that water is released and comes out at the front. Mount Rainier does this all the time of the Cots Glacier and some of the southern glaciers that are here. They're famous here and especially coming off of Vatney Yokel, that's why nobody lives on the southeast shore because all of a sudden you would just get wiped out by this. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, 1996 one occurred under Grim Fulton. Uh, and a uh, huge, huge one came down. The, uh, uh, Mount Catala had one, the Mearsdal Yokel, uh, and the largest uh, 200,000 cubic meters per second came down. Uh, and so what they do, if they're braided streams, and remember that tells you that there are glaciers at the upper part, but it also tells you that these Yokel Alps could be possible. And, and there, this is up in the area of Denny Foss. And you can see there's no vegetation around. Everything has been scoured by big floods in the past, no soil or anything. Now, if we look at, at, at a, the biggest floods in the past, freshwater floods of the world, the largest uh, up until a few years ago, we always said was Altai, Russia, 18 million cubic meters per second. The second largest was the Missoula floods, the very first Missoula floods, 17 million cubic meters per second. Uh, and then the, a paper came out eh, maybe eight or nine years ago, uh, and it said that the, the largest one was 19 million cubic meters per second, and that was the one uh, that I'll show you in a second. Now, Jim O'Connor, uh, adjunct professor at Portland State, U.S. Geological Survey on the Portland State campus, he's a specialist in this. He worked under um, Vic Baker of Missoula flood fame for his PhD. He calculated eh, Altai Russia is smaller than us, uh, and then the, the uh, Icelandic one is smaller than both of them. And so we have moved up in the first place. Altai is second. And then the one, uh, there's Altai, Russia. Uh, and then the one right here is the one that I take everybody to is now number three in the world of the world's largest one. Uh, and this is part of the gorge that was cut by that. But when you're up on top, it is just completely uh, there. It's just scoured away for miles and miles on both sides. Uh, an incredible flood uh, that was found at that time. All right, now I got to tell you about the, the world's most famous volcanic eruption of just the, the last century. And this was in 2010. That was AFE at the Yokel. Uh, my guide, local guide at the time, Oli, said, Scott, you will not leave this island until you pr can pronounce this properly. Um, and it took me a lot of working on that, but I can now say AFB at the Yokel. Yokel means a glacier. Uh, it produced an ash cloud that was six miles high, stopped air traffic in Europe for, from North America to Europe and all across Europe for six days. Six billion dollars of economic loss as a result of that. Uh, and uh, what happened is it, the volcano originally started erupting outside of the glacier, but then it moved underneath the glacier and you had 200, 200 
meters of ice on top of it, which were all melted by the eruption. All that water going down into the lava creates what we call a phreatic eruption, huge amounts of ash that comes out as a result of that. Uh, and, and, and shut down everybody. I'll show you pictures of that. Now, the next year, 2011, under Grim Volton, another one of the uh, glaciers up there, um, a volcano started erupting and said, oh my God, we're gonna shut down all of the uh, ice, uh, air traffic again. But what happened is the, uh, the eruption moved out away from the glacier onto rock and it was just a nice tourist eruption. So uh, the uh, Aethiat Leocal started out as a tourist eruption on the rock. And at nighttime, uh, helicopters would be flying over to take pictures like this one here. And so you had lots and lots of nighttime photos. You had flowing lava coming down off of this. It was a nice tourist eruption that was occurring daytime. Look at all of the people in the lower part watching the place. It was all on bedrock. It was here. And then all of a sudden it moved underneath the glacier off in the distance. And, it, and so that was in March that they had the tourist eruption. In April, it started producing huge amounts of ash. And as the ash was going up, as it started erupting, look at all of the lightning that was created as that ash was moving at very, very fast velocities uh, up there. This is April 19th and all of the lightning and it's a, what they call a dirty thunderstorm uh, that w resulted from this. And here you can barely see the ash coming out as it was going across the environment here. And then during the daytime, you can see the ash clouds, they are very, very dark in color. The, the white ones, that's steam. That's good. Ash is not good for uh, airplanes. And then that ash cloud, where did it go? It went right towards Europe. Uh, and then here is an, uh, some more steam eruption and some ash mixed in with it heading there. On the ground, uh, look at all the ash that was deposited, just like Mount St. Helens. This is April 15th, and this was down very close to Aefiat Leocal. Um, and then here's a map. There is Greenland off in the distance, Iceland here, and then here is Northern Europe. There's Great Britain. There is Denmark uh, over here. Northern Europe, there's where the major amount of ash came down, just shut down all of the air flights coming in there. So to end with, I just wanted to mention just a couple things about the vegetation and the animals there and a couple Icelandic traditions. Uh, first of all, you're very far north. Uh, and so there are about 200 species of grasses, mosses, and flowering plants, and a few trees that are there. But the trees, 90%, 95% of all the forests have been cut for buildings, for building boats, uh, and then firewood. And many of them would not grow back uh, as the, um, after the little ice age. The few forests that are there are primarily birch trees and large pine trees. Large is the pine tree that loses its needles in the wintertime. You create beautiful colors. And interestingly, many of the fields, I'm a hay farmer. I'm just about ready to cut my five acres of hay. Uh, and, and many of the hay fields have cotton grass in it. What's cotton grass? It looks like cotton. It, it means wetland. Most of their hay fields are wetlands which is, is quite interesting. And then also we're so far north, uh, most of the vegetation is Arctic and Alpine. Here is, uh, here is Moss Campion, Silena collis, which is a cushion plant, lots of cushion plants there. I used to do work in the Alpine zone and the Arctic, and this is very, very common. And the other one, this is the most common one. This is called mountain or Arctic dryad, Dryas octopetala. It's found in all of the Arctic environments, all uh, Northern hemisphere and Southern hemisphere. Now here are some of these forests that are here and you can see that they are cut and managed. And most of these are going to be large pine trees that grow North in this area. I was enamored the first time I went to Iceland because along all the highways you had all this wild lupin and they're so beautiful and I said oh this is gorgeous then I found out they're all imported imported from Alaska by the highway department because uh, uh, it's a strain developed in Alaska and it stabilizes all of the the soil next to the roads and cuts down on erosion that is there but it's, it's also very beautiful but introduced how about animals here? Not many wild animals there. There are lots of, there's 70 species total, 
that breed here. Uh, there are 25 species of seabirds. My favorite is the puffin. Oh, they are this, they're fat little guys that can barely grow, or fly, and they have tiny wings, but they're wonderful. Um, and uh, they live in the cliffs, uh, especially on the islands. Very few perching birds, the passerines. Uh, they feed on insects. Why? Because there are very few insects here. Uh, there are three North American uh, birds, the loon, brown's golden eye, and the uh, golden diver. Uh, and then my favorite bird there, other than the puffin, is the Arctic tern. And they come all the way from Antarctica, 17,000 miles, to uh, lay their eggs in here. Uh, and uh, there were lots and lots of them uh, breeding when we, uh, in many of the cliffs that were there. Also, another one that I love is the ptarmigan. It is a, a type of grouse that turns white in the wintertime, so it blends in. And they do have a few birds of prey, a couple raptors. They have a merlin, and then they have a, the white-tailed eagle. In the Mivatan area, they have a lot of ducks, and they're the eider ducks. And uh, the eider ducks, when they lay their eggs, they take a lot of the down underneath their, their normal wings and they line the eggs and that's eider down. And it is prized in Europe for stuffing of your duvets. Uh, and they get up to 2,000 pounds, uh, $2,000 a pound per kilogram uh, uh, for the eider for the stuffing of duvets. Um, we always take our groups out on a boat to visit the, um, and we get dressed up in red suits to look at the puffins. Look at all the puffins, eight million puffins in Iceland. And there must have been a million on this little island, uh, very close to Husavik up north. Uh, there Also, other animals that are found there, Arctic fox turns white in the wintertime, uh, just like the ptarmigan does. There are four rodents, the long-tailed field mouse, the house mouse, the long-tailed mouse, and the brown rat. Where did the brown rat come from? From boats. And they're also minks there. How, why are they here? Well, they were brought in to farm. And then they escaped from the farms in the 1930s, which was the Depression time. And now they are found all over. And then they introduced uh, reindeer from Lapland. And now there are 3,000 that are raised here. Lots of sea mammals, though. Harbor seal, half the world population is in this area. And then they have other uh, sea lions, for instance, and whales. They got the minke whale, porpoises, humpback are the main ones that you have got there. Here's a picture of the Arctic fox in wintertime. It, grow, it turns white, just like the ptarmigan does. And you can see here, I've got a couple summer and winter uh, stuffed animals uh, that are there. How about food there? My favorite thing are the longestine. These are baby lobsters that you can see there with a good glass of wine that is there and it's mm, yummy. Uh, and then a weird thing that they have is shark. And this is the Iceland, no, this is the Greenland green shark. You really can't uh, eat it. Uh, and when it gets involved in the, the fish nets of the fishermen, they give them to this guy up on the Snifeles Nest Peninsula. Uh, and he dries it, he cuts them up, and because it doesn't have a urinary tract, it has to hang there for three months, uh, and all of the urine and all of the meat comes out, and then he cuts it up into little squares, and uh, it's an Icelandic tradition on New Year's to uh, eat a piece of Icelandic uh, uh, shark, uh, and then follow it with uh, um, aquavit, which is Scandinavian fire water. Well, since I was the, the head guide, there's Ole, my local guide, he said, Scott, you get to taste the first shark. And so I not only followed it with the aquavit, I preceded it with the aquavit, and then closed, but it wasn't that bad. And so that is a the tradition there. Um, it's interesting here, I, I, being a hay farmer, when they uh, cut their hay, it automatically goes into these plastic wraps. The reason is they never get to dry it out. I have to dry my hay out so we can put it into bales. And so it ferments inside and, and produce, produces a, uh, a very, very good type of food for the grazing animals that are going, the cows generally that use that. A couple of traditions, Scandinavian, this is the only place in Scandinavia where uh, the sons and daughters take, have a different last name. And it used to be, if your name was Jens or Jens and you had a son named Hans, his name would be Hans Jensen. And then if Hans had a son, 
Soren, he would be Soren Hansen. And then, and then if Soren had a son Christian, he would be Christian Sorensen. Uh, and so every generation, your last name changed. And the women would do the same thing. And, uh, and so if Hans had a daughter named Brianna, she would be Brianna uh, Hans's daughter. Uh, and then, uh, the next then, the, then the next generation, Sylvia would be Sylvia, Brianna's daughter. Um, now, all of the Scandinavian countries, when they divided up uh, uh, from Denmark into Denmark, Sweden, and Norway in the 1830s, everybody froze their last name. But in, in uh, here in Iceland, they did not. Uh, and, and so today, here, it, it, geologists love going to Den, uh, de, uh, graveyards, nice piece of nice here. And you can see Here's the uh, uh, Olina Olik's daughter and Hjalti Janssen over here. And so even though they're married, they will have different names because of their father. Uh, the, I also, being a golfer, I love golf courses. Great golf course, a couple of them that are found there. And the Icelandic horse is very interesting. They have an interesting gait. If an Icelandic horse leaves the country, it can never come back to the country, and you cannot import any other types of horses into the country. It only can, they only can have Icelandic horses. Mm -hmm. uh, you still find a few sod houses here. In the early days when they had very little wood there, um, you couldn't build many buildings. You could build the structure, but then you use the roof being sod. Uh, to end with, I just wanted to mention the history of the country. Um, Pythias, a famous Greek, uh, wrote early in the fourth century about the Ultima Thule, a place that had lots and lots of uh, snow and ice. In the sixth and seventh centuries, Irish monks actually settled Thule. And then in the eight, 800 ADs, the, you had the early Vikings coming over. Uh, a Norwegian named Hrafna Flöki came in, and, and he was the first guy, he called it Iceland. And then uh, Ingvar for Armandsen, uh, he also came here with his brother. They settled on the southeast coast. And, and then by nine, uh, 930 AD, 25,000 Vikings, mostly from Norway, had come in. And that's when they had their first parliament. Uh, the parliament in the year 1000 AD declared Christianity was the uh, uh, national uh, religion of the country. And then in 1397, Scandinavian Union transferred Iceland from Nor uh, Norway to Denmark. So Denmark really ran it for many, many years. Back in 1600, uh, remember I showed you, Hamey, where the uh, uh, volcanic eruption was? 3,000 pirates lived over there. In 1873, you had the Lockheed Volcano. Uh, that erupted and killed 10,000 people there. And then in uh, 1854, the trade monopoly with Denmark ended, but it still kept uh, being in charge. And in June 17, 1944, during World War II, uh, Iceland broke off from Denmark, became independent. Also in 1980, uh, incredible, the prime minister of the country, country Vigdis Finnbogdottir, uh, became the very first female democratically elected in world history, uh, uh, head, head of state. 2008 was a huge economic depression. Iceland stuck the presidents of the five banks into jail, and they're still in jail today. What did we do with our bankers? We said, oh, slapped their hands and then gave them a huge raise. Uh, so if you get, if you want a chance, go visit this geological paradise. You'll love the nature, you'll love the geology, land of no uh, pollution. And as you can see here, visit Thingvellir. This is in the winter time that is here. I wanted to show you a picture of the, when I was there a few years ago, just the, the week before, they had a huge landslide, the biggest landslide. Uh, this is out in West, uh, West Iceland uh, that had ever occurred. And I wanted to show you a picture of uh, Dave and, oh, no, Dave and Linda Tozer, <laughs> G-Sockers, who surprised me two years ago uh, on the trip. And I said, whoa, it's great having you. Dave has got a little bandage on his nose because he's the guy that fell down climbing the volcano, but he ended up being okay. I also, the last tradition I wanted to mention is, uh, Christmas time, who comes and brings the gifts? It bring, it's Santa Claus. All the Scandinavian countries, it's Yulaman, Christmas man. And uh, a guy with white beard and tall and a big red coat. Uh, and, uh, but it, here in, in Iceland, 
All of the gifts are brought by the Eula lads. They're that, those are the Christmas boys. Uh, and they are naughty guys. And you put your shoes out for 11 straight days. And each day, a different Eula lad will come and deliver a Christmas present in your shoe. You put it on the um, uh, windowsill of your house. And it's an incredible tradition. There is a great book that came out with that and uh, I would love to do that. So to end with, uh, hopefully you have enjoyed a little bit about the geology of Iceland, an incredible place on the face of the earth. You know, Iceland air flies here during the summertime. Uh, if you do get on, uh, ask who the pilot is. Uh, now they aren't flying right now because of the virus, but if you do get on, ask who the pilot is. If it is Pal Olesen, that's my nephew from Denmark. Uh, who is a pilot there. In la two years ago, he flew me back uh, from Iceland. It's inexpensive Alice, uh, 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 airline. Go and see the land of fire and ice. And if you have any questions, put it in the chat box and maybe we'll have time for Sheila to ask a few questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, great.